give us a break in between. Sister Gardner. Yes. Yeah. Pass the scripture for us, please, ma'am. Yes. Psalms 89. Yes. Psalms 89. I will sing of the mercies of the Lord forever with my mouth. I will make known thy faithfulness to all generations. For I have said, mercy shall be built up forever. Thy faithfulness shall thou establish in every heaven. I have made a covenant with my chosen. I have sworn unto David my servant. Thy seed will I establish forever and build up thy throne of generations. In all and the heavens shall praise thy wonders, O Lord, thy faithfulness in the congregation of the saints. For who in heaven can be compared unto the Lord? Who is among the sons of the mighty will be likened unto our Lord? I just read Psalms number 89, verses 1 through 6. May the Lord add a blessing to the readers, hearers, and doers of his holy word. Let us bow with Brother Dempsey. Heavenly Father, I would come to get some insight on your word this in the Father God. We pray that you will move everything that will hinder us from receiving your word. For this lesson this afternoon, Father God, is an interesting and very insightful lesson. It is probably letting some of us know that God is talking about his son Jesus as his servant during this, in this lesson. Father God, for we know that God can do all things but fail. And we know he can use whoever he wants to use. So in this lesson, it's preparing us that God use his son and letting us know also that he can use us as well. And we will all do what he has desired for us to do. And Heavenly Father, we say thank you for this day and all that has happened in this day. Thank you for life, help, and strength. Thank you, Father God, for your love your grace and mercy. Thank you, God, for being with the sick, the old, those in Colorado behind prison ball, and those that is sin, somewhat seen lost. Father God, we ask that you be with those that is lost in the highways and byways of life. Trust them, Father God, that they will come around and ask them what must they do to be saved. Father God, it is in Jesus Christ's name we pray. Amen. Thank you, God. Amen. Thank God for his goodness and for his love. Our lesson today comes from the 49th chapter of the book of Isaiah. Isaiah, who was known unto us as the eagle-eyed prophet, that is, he was able to see farther down the road than most of the other prophets. I would suggest to us that we read the 49th uh, chapter of Isaiah in its entirety. There are perhaps some of us, if not most of us, who have never even read the 49th <laughs> ninth chapter of the book of Isaiah. So therefore, <laughs> all of this is kind of confusing to us. We only have a verses one through 13 in our text the background scriptures at 117, but I would suggest now that you go back and read and reread again. When I hurt you none, if you backed up to 47, I my mean 48, and do just a little bit in 50, it wouldn't hurt you none at all uh, because uh, as we further we go into the book of Isaiah, the more we'll find that God is talking to this eagle-eyed prophet that he's telling us. And God, our overall topic talks about God foretells redemption. I made myself a note and said that the God of the universe 
who knows all that there is to be known, not only foretells about the redemption of his people, Israel and Judah, but God knows about us, us, us. And I'm glad, as Dr. C. W. Clark said, that I'm a member of the us crowd. Glad to see my baby on that too. Shook and she's almost looking pretty is a grandmother. Bless her. She's hey, looking. Hey, Daddy. Hey, everybody. She's almost looking that pretty. Almost now. Now, now she ain't. <laughs> she got to go a little way, but almost. Thank the Lord for, for her today. I would suggest that you do that. Because if you don't do it, in fact, that's why I say we did with 49 last 48 last week, and even in this lesson today, will suggest to us that we would the last three verses of chapters 48 need really to be in read in conjunction with 49, that you can kind of begin to understand what the lesson is talking about. Now, I'm not gonna be able to be there to hold your hand and try to guide you through. So I'm gonna have to ask you just to be kind and do some reading. God foretells redemption. And let me remind you that redemption lies solely within the hands of the almighty God. Our key text says, thus said the Lord, in an acceptable time have I heard thee, and in days of salvation have I helped thee, and I will preserve thee and give thee for a covenant of the people to establish the earth to cause the inheritance, the desolate heritage. I would also suggest, I think this author does a, a good job on trying to bring us up to date, to try to get us to understand this great book of the book of Isaiah. Israel, in its text in this introduction says, was also waiting patiently, waiting for God to act in conjunction with 1 Peter 10 through 13. And while these and while thy freedom in him would certainly come with responsibility. In other words, along with being a child of God, goes responsibilities. Amen. Some of us don't know that. Uh, and the more and the more that you learn about God, the more you find out that you don't know and the more you find out you need to be involved in doing what thus says the Lord. The book of Isaiah, he says to us in the background scripture, there are four poems about the Messiah, Isaiah 42, and Isaiah 49, one through seven. Isaiah 50, verses four through nine, or Isaiah 50, verse 11, and 52, 13, and 53, 12. They are called servant poems, or servant song. A fifth passage in Isaiah 61 
uh, is sometime added for the list because its context is very similar to the others, even though the word servant is not used in it. Our text today is from the second servant song. It is more than a poem about a servant. It is a prophecy about the works of Jesus, the Messiah. It is he who is the servant in the poem. This servant song begins and ends an appeal not only to Israel, but also to nations, nations, nations of the world. The last three verses of chapters 48 echoes the people to flee from Babylon. We dealt with that last week. It was Babylon's job to kind of do a, to do a job on the cheering of Israel to get them to understand who God was. Jeremiah tried to warn them, but the kings had other king, had other soothsayers who were telling him that don't listen to what that preacher said. Ain't nothing gonna happen. Jeremiah told him, well, if don't nothing happen, then God most certainly has not been talking to me. But if it does happen, <laughs> oh no, when it does happen, you will know that God was speaking to me. And as Babylon surrounded Jerusalem, Nebuchadnezzar and his group came. And then when they captured the king, they let the king see all of his sons being slaughtered in his sight. And then after the king saw all of his sons to know that there was not going to be any, an another resurrection of the tribe of Judah, he, they gorged the king's eyes out and led him down into Babylon. There, uh, he died. The servant's son. The servant's son. So, the identity, verse one, of the servant called by God. Listen, O I want to men. And the word hearken also means listen, ye people from afar. The speaker, the servant, is not yet identified. It's only identified when you get to Isaiah 49 3 below. The exhortation is a listening is a necessary precaution as to recording any news. You see that in Exodus 23. Let me just read that because sometime when Moses was telling folk, and even sometime when I'm trying to tell folk, they don't listen to what God is saying. They Exodus 23. They won't listen. We got our own viewers that I don't need to listen to what he said. But in Exodus 23, 21 and 22, the Lord says, Beware of him that obey his voice. Provoke him not, for he will not pardon your transgression for well, my name is in him but if thou shalt indeed endure the voice and to do all I speak then I will be an enemy unto thine enemy and an adversary unto thy adversary in other words God is saying when you act right I will be with you and I will be there to fight your battle for you. Got that song out that says, 
He may not come when you want him, but he's always <laughs> on time. And I got one or two folks listening to me that know that I'm, and when I said to us earlier, I'm glad the trouble don't last away. I got one or two folks know that God always stepped right in. You're just about to give up and God steps in and lets you know that he is still God. Be part of first one Say the Lord has called me from the womb, from the bowels of my mother, has he made mention of my name? And Jeremiah says in Jeremiah 1 5, before I was conceived into my mother's womb, God knew me and God ordained me a prophet unto the people of God. Each of us who are called of God, God knew of us, about us, before we were conceived into our mother's womb. And for those of us who God had called to be preacher prophets, God know our name and God has established us. Oh yes. When you read about angels, I'm gonna ask you to do some, some, some reading for me. And when you find the word angel, tell me how many of those angels that you find will be an effeminate gender. <laughs> I, 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 ain't gonna, I ain't gonna sit and stand. I just want y'all to find it. And tell me how, that will, how many that will be in the effeminate gender. There are folk who got uh, Lady Angel, I, 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 I'm, I'm a little bit, I'm a little bit, just a little bit leery about that. But you tell me, I'm going to let you do some research. And then you tell me, and I'm going to tell you in advance that when angels are referred to, they're always referred to as he. Amen. And he ain't no he, she either. He's he. God uh, bless us. The Lord has called me. What could give a person more confidence in according to know that the Lord has called him from the womb? God's plan is not haphazardly or slam dash. It is not being made up as humanity progresses without an end. And, in God's mind. Rather, God knows his intentions for the servants before his mother was aware she was pregnant. Isaiah says to us, 714, for unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given. And his name shall be called Wonderful Counselor, the Mighty God, the Everlasting Father, the Prince of Peace. And Isaiah 6 9 says, For unto us a son is given. Amen. And then in Isaiah in Matthew 21, uh, before Mary was pregnant, God had, had to warn, God had to kind of talk to Joseph a little bit and tell him, Don't you be afraid to take her for that which is conceived in her is of the Holy Ghost and his name shall be called Jesus. Some of us, my color with the Lord had talked to us real good <laughs> and long when we were still, <laughs> we were still had doubt about what God is saying. So God had for you'll find that in Matthew 121. God bless us. Shakespeare said, what's in a name? In the case of the servant, quite a lot. More important than revealing the name itself is the fact that God made mention of it. We are, we've all expressed greed in someone 
who was clearly forgotten our name. Had it happen to me Sunday, I left and went. And I knew that fellow face, I couldn't call his name for nothing. And then when he come over and I had to do some pretend he come over and call my name, I wouldn't even try to call his name because I knew I couldn't get it right. And then finally it come to me. So of who he was. And when you've been around a little bit, uh, don't be surprised that there are folk that know your name that you just may not or might not know the name. It might be embarrassing for a while, but it just mentions like this, but there is a name that you ought to know because there is a name and the only name that have salvation in it. And we read in John 3, 16, for God so loved the world that he gave his only son that who said believeth in him should not perish, but that he could have, they, they could have eternal or everlasting life. 17, we don't read. God didn't send Jesus into the world to condemn us, but through him that we could be saved to a, and he has made my mouth like a sharp sword. Sometimes, and swords will cut you, sharp swords will cut you. Sometimes the preacher, pastor, or the preacher prophet says stuff that cuts you and you want to kind of get angry with him. In the contents of the sharp sword in the prophet's mouth likely refers to the word of God. His servant to speak prophetically. God endures these words in Ephesians 6. 17, turn it right quick, Ephesians 6, 17. Ephesians 6, 17, the Lord says, and take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God. God would cut you sometimes. Well, no, no, not sometimes. God would cut you, cut you all of the time. And many times we don't like what we hear. And we will try to hide and pretend that it's someone else. Although Jesus would pay peace with when accepted, they also act to divide the righteous from the unrighteous. In the shadows of his hand has God made me and made me a polished shaft in a quiver as he hit me. The shadows of God, the shadow of God, whether his hand or his wing is one way to speak of the safety of being in God. Isaiah 51, six says, like a polished shaft, God kept the servant safe and ready so that when his task came, his servant would be peacefully able to accomplish his work. In conjunction with the image of the sword, this implies judgment to show those who do not accept the word of his servant. 
There are folks sometimes who don't want to say what the servant says. So I just spoke of the servant's preparation and for how for 30 years, Jesus was preparing himself for what was going to happen to him when he went and prayed one night until sweat like drops of blood fell from his brow. And one within him, one of his way, came and kissed him because he told the crowd, the one that I kissed, that's him. And Jesus knew him. And he said, Judas, thou betrayest me with a kiss. I'm glad even Isaiah said it and, and Matthew said it. They led him from judgment hall to judgment hall. He wouldn't fight them. And he says to us in John 18, 37, for this cause came I into the world and unto this end was I born. He allowed them to do what they did to him. He said, no man can take my life. I lay it down. If I lay it down, I'll take it up again. And then early on the third day morning, thank God for the women. Whew. When the women got there, the angel had rolled a stone back and told him, I know who you're looking for. He is not here. He is arisen, as he said, and go quickly and tell the disciple. So the men, God Almighty help us men, had kind of ran off for a while, but thank God for the faithful ladies, women who stayed around the tomb and who still at least they went to anoint, to anoint the body where the men were afraid and had barricaded themselves in a room. And when Jesus stepped to the door, what would happen if y'all know I'm dead, y'all locked up and I would step to the door? <laughs> That right said somebody, somebody would leave in a hurry. And he told them, don't, don't hold it, hold it, hold it. It's me. Look at my hands. Look at my side. And Judas Iscariot wasn't there. And he said, Lord, unless I can see a hole in his hands, I won't believe that. Eight days later, when they were all together, Jesus stepped to the door again. And he said, come at Judas. I know what you've been thinking. Yeah, that's right. Oh, yes. Did y'all know that it's found in 139 number of Psalm that the Lord know our thoughts are far off and that he is acquainted with all of our ways. God know what you're thinking. Woo. That's kind of scary, is it? You thinking, and you don't, other folk might not know, but God knows your thoughts. And he's acquainted not with some, but all of your ways. Verse three. And God said unto me, you are my servant, O Israel, and whom I will be glorified. The Lord named the speaker, his servant. A few explanations can be given for why Israel is named. One view is that Jesus is the true Israel. And this is implied in a figurative speech because Jesus is the fulfillment of God's plan to bless all nations. And in Genesis 12, 
you see where he's, you read he's talking to Abraham, but Abraham, the Lord tells him, through you, all nations of the earth shall be blessed. Israel was meant to be. Another possibility is that God does speak here to the nation as people in whom I will be glorified. We are to, as we are edified, we are to glorify the name of God. In other words, if you don't know him, you can't give him no glory. Amen. I ain't gonna ask nobody to raise a hand. I'm gonna ask you to ask yourself, how well do I know him? And how much glory do I give the Lord? Or is it all about me? And me. Then Israel would be fulfilled in the church, which has taken up Israel's spiritual name and carried the good news of the Messiah into the into all the world. Y'all do know that the Lord says. In Acts 1 8, uh, when the Holy Ghost will come upon you, you shall be my witness, beginning in Jerusalem and Judea, and into the uttermost parts of the earth. All of us sometimes think it's on most think it's on the preacher, but all of us. And because of the churches of Christ's body empowered by the Spirit, ultimately. The servant really is Jesus. Jesus came to serve, and he had them understand. For this cause came I into the world to render this service. Confidence in God. And I said, I have labored in vain. I have spent my strength for no. And in vain, yet surely my judgment is with the Lord and my work with my God. Is there any more discouraging feeling than to look at one's work and feel that you've labored in vain? Prophet Isaiah, or Prophet Jeremiah, felt that way when he tried to warn Israel about what not to do. They wouldn't listen. And the Babylonians come and got them and taken them away into exile. Verse five. And now said the Lord that formed me from the womb to be a servant, to bring Judah again to him. Though Israel be not gathered, yet shall I be glorified in the eyes of the Lord and my God shall be my strength. The womb recalls Isaiah 49, 1b, while the servant's focus glories point back to 49, 3. This repetitious is the one Isaiah expresses here in this confidence. My God, my God shall be my strength. Represents a reversal of 49.4, where the servant had felt that his strength was wasted with God, that strength would be renewed and sustained. In this verse, the word Jacob and Israel are used interchangeable. When David died, Solomon, his son, got everything. Pretty good point what his mama had told him. 
She told him, you need to go and talk to, to King. And that's what the prophet told her because they was already getting ready to do something different. But here, when, when, when uh, this word Israel, Israel means when he died, when, when Solomon died, the tribes were split into two. The 10 tribes were known as Israel. The two tribes was known as Judah. Stan dealt with it the other last Sunday, and I've said to us over and over again, because when you read the text, all of the kings did that which was evil in the sight of God on the northern side. And they fell into the hands of the Syrians in 722 BC. Israel, Judah, who are the two tribes who lasted 130 plus years later, they fell into the hands of the Babylonians. And 586, 87 BC, because the kings walked according to what the Lord says until they get further down the road. And then they too began to start doing what they thought that they would do. And the Lord allowed them to be taken into captivity. God sometimes would allow stuff to happen to you because of your attitude and action toward him. Amen. Kind of need to work on yourself. And don't nobody really have to tell you about how good you're acting or how good you are. You know that for yourself. Now we will try to sham and want folks to think that we are almost about to spite weren't sprout wings. But deep down in our heart, of heart, we know that we got a big folk in our hand. Stop playing with yourself. And if there's any two persons you ought to work to be true to, is to yourself and to God. You can't fool yourself. And you can't fool God. God know you. Amen. Thank God for that. Then God's plan. Six and eight. I'm going to have to close. God's plan, he said, is a light thing. That thought should it be my servant to raise up the tribe of Jacob and to restore the, pres the preserved of Israel. Jacob and Israel, as I said, so sometimes are used interchangeable. Jacob, Jacob was the son of, of that was out of the 12 tribes of Israel. Jacob is the man that had the 12, 12 son. He become known as Israel. And later on, uh, Jacob, uh, nation to nation was known as Israel. And then as a, on, a, on a division of that, it was divided into Israel and into Judah. Nothing in history of the tribes of Jacob's success that restoring the people would be a light thing. The people struggle with our faithfulness throughout their days in Egypt, in the wilderness, and in the promised land. Indeed, though Israel had been a united nation, idolatry contributed to thou falling away of that fracture to the northern tribe. You remember when Moses in Exodus 20, 21, after he gave the tribe in Trade 20, Moses went away to get the command from the Lord. And when he come back, his brother had built a golden calf. And 
there was a strange cross, strange noise in the in the crowd. And uh, they found that the people of Israel, just just shortly out of out of slavery and worship by God, went back again to worshiping strange and false and idol gods. Amen. Verse 6a. 6b, I will also give thee for a light to the Gentile that thou mayest be my salvation unto the end of the earth. God, it was God's plan back in Genesis chapter 12 because we read through thee, all nations of the earth shall be blessed. God came to the Jews, but he also came to save all Gentile, and in Acts chapter 15, when there was a fuss going on, and Paul told Peter, you remember that when you went to Cornelius, Cornelius was a Gentile, and you preached to him, and you saw how the Holy Spirit fell on the Gentiles, and you said, you said then, that I perceive then that God is, is no respecter person, as the Holy Spirit fell on us, the Jews, it also has fallen upon the Gentile. And that is even present today. God don't care about pigmentation. God is concerned about the spirit that is in your heart. And for that reason, Paul wrote in Romans 1, 14, 15, 16, I am indebted both to the Greek and to the barbarian, both to the wise and to the unwise. So much as in me is, I'm ready to preach the gospel to them who are Gentiles also. And he did just that. God want the gospel for all people, not just for a certain people, for all people. Then, seven, eight, you know, I'm gonna have to close. He said, thus said the Lord, the Redeemer of Israel and the Holy One to him whom man despises, to him whom the nation are her, to a servant or a ruler, with the, what the Lord does flow from his character and the title attributed to the God results from his action. The Redeemer of Israel acted to free the people from slavery in Egypt in Exodus 6, Exodus 15, 13, and he said, God chose Israel to be his special people. But whether they act in holiness or not, God remained the high one. God's title here emphasized his power and majestic fidelity in his power and his sole claim of holiness that he is Lord who addressed the holiness that the Lord who delivered one from man despises and nations are heard. Other words, God, even though man might reject God, but thank God, God still holds us up in the hall of his hand. Verse 7b says, kings shall see and arise, princes who also shall worship because of the Lord that is faithful and the Holy One of Israel, and he shall choose thee. Effectively, the rejection of man and nation in Isaiah 49.7 is here dismissed. Both king and princes will hear the servant word as with my success in ministry, 
is not based on the charisma um, of the magnetism of the leadership or quality, but it is based rather upon the results of, of what God says. There is reason people respond with worship, with hearing the gospel is become the Lord's faithfulness. And we need to say, amen, amen. It's not based upon what you say, but it's based upon what God said. Thus said the Lord, and in an acceptable time have I heard thee, and in the day of salvation have I helped thee. I will preserve thee, and I will give you my covenant to establish the earth, to cause, to inherit the desolate heritage, the acceptable time of the day of salvation or uh, parallel here, both denotes the time when God uh, shall hear his people and act again on their behalf. In short term, this will be seen in the people return from Babylon. Ultimately, Babylon, Babylon, even in the day of Jesus, Paul quotes the excerpt in 2 Timothy, in 2 Corinthians 6, 2, what he says, uh, salvation is in the name of the Lord. Thus said the Lord, salvation is in God's name. Salvation is in his name. Thus, that thou mayest know of the prisoners, go forth to them that are in darkness. Show yourself. This concept directly relates to God's role as a redeemer in 47, 40, 49, 7 above. The image continues in the idea that those who are oppressed or in darkness may shed that fear because God has chosen to rescue them. It wasn't your idea, it was God's idea. They shall feed in the way and they shall be pastures here and I place the image from here, you'll find it again. When in Psalm 23, it says to them, now uh, uh, in, in Psalm 23, he says to us, uh, God is a way, and then he said, he said, you shall be like trees planted by the rivers of waters that bring forth his fruit in his season. His leaves fall so shall not wither, and whatsoever he doeth shall prosper. It's not so with those who are not a part of God. Now, I like what he, that's what he says, for God knows the way of the righteous, Jive with me, if you can. But God knows the way of the righteous with the way of the ungodly shall perish. Let me jump to verse 11. And I will make all of my maintenance a way and a highway shall be established. A traveling approach of mountain in ancient times had three options. One, go over it. Two, go around it. Three, turn around and go the other way. But when the servant led the people, even in the mountain, that would be a safe way across the Highway here likely refers to the desert road that would have been sunken, rising from made them less treacherous. Behold, thou shalt come forth from far, and lo, these from the north and from the west and from the land of Shittim. Sing! 
O hill and land rejoice over it, and break forth in the singing, O mountain. For the Lord has comforted his people and will have mercy upon his affliction. Sing, be joyful, and break forth into singing a parallel here. The repetition here again emphasized that joyful singing is a corrupt impulse in the Hebrew thinking. And that's what we need to learn how to do. Sing and be happy at the right time. It won't happen until the right time. But at the right time, God sent Jesus to the earth to offer salvation to all who accept him. And we read in Romans 5, 8, that God commended his love toward us and in that while we were yet sinners Christ died for us and Galatians 4 4 says in the fullness of time when the time got right God sent forth his son born of a woman to redeem us that we will not have to worry about being a part of the Lord then the Lord tells us us who have accepted the ways of the Lord in Matthew 28. Let me see 17. 28, 17 says, and when they saw him, they worshiped him, but some doubted. And he said unto them, go ye therefore into all the world, teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost. Then the Lord declares, and lo, I'll be with you always, even unto the end of the earth. God sends, God sends a redeemer God sent uh, a way that the people might be saved. God sends, and since God knows, he foretells not only about Israel's redemption, but he retells about the redemption of the whole world. God bless us. Heaven smile upon us. Let us repeat the watchword. I'm persuaded by the teaching of the